when I first went into ecology, we really did believe that nature had to have a fixed stability. It had to be stable. And that's what we were taught, that the miraculous thing about nature was that it was stable against all these problems. And so we believed there was a balance of nature. The balance of nature idea comes from two things, ancient Western mythology and religious beliefs, and also from the machine age, because the actual mathematics that came out of it was mathematics of machinery. Nature should have that same kind of mechanical steady state, which would fit in with this balance of nature idea, that if you left nature alone, it would run like a perfectly oiled piston engine. At the end of the First World War, a young biologist called Arthur Tansley had a frightening dream. He dreamt he was in an African village. The natives started to come towards him. Then his wife appeared. He picked up a rifle, aimed it at her, and pulled the trigger. Tansley wanted to know what the dream meant. So he started to study the ideas of Sigmund Freud, and he became fascinated. And in 1922, he even went to Vienna to be analysed by Freud himself. What caught Tansley's imagination was part of Freud's theory that said that the human brain was actually an electrical machine. That the sense data that came in through the eyes and the ears created bursts of energy that flowed around networks inside the brain, just like electrical circuits. Townsley was fascinated by this, and he made an extraordinary conceptual leap. He decided that he could take this model of the mind and apply it to the whole of the natural world. He became convinced that underneath the complexity of nature were systems, vast interconnected circuits that linked all animals and plants, through which energy flowed. He invented a name for them. He called them ecosystems. But Tansley went much further. He said that if these ecosystems were disturbed, they would always try and return to an original, balanced state, which meant that they had the ability to regulate and stabilise themselves. It was part of what Tansley called the great universal law of equilibrium. All these systems, he wrote, are constantly tending towards positions of balance or equilibrium. In 1935, Arthur Tansley accused one of the most powerful men in the British Empire of abusing ecological ideas. He was Field Marshal Smuts, who was the autocratic ruler of South Africa. Smuts used ecological ideas to develop a philosophy he called holism. Holism said that the whole world was one giant organic system in which everything had its natural place. So long as everyone stayed in their proper place, this global system would be stable. Smuts had a vision of a new global world order, where artificial distinctions like nations would disappear. And his model for this world system was the British Empire. And it would be managed by the white European races, because that was their natural place in the whole. What Smuts was doing showed how easily scientific ideas about nature and natural equilibrium could be used by those in power to maintain the status quo. Townsley hated this, and he publicly accused Smuts of what he called the abuse of vegetational concepts. The idea that there was an underlying balance of nature went back thousands of years in Western culture. But it had always been a dream, a vision of a hidden natural order. What Tansley was saying was that this might be scientifically true, that from the English countryside to the jungles of Africa, there was an underlying mechanism that regulated nature as if it were a machine. But it was only a hypothesis. No one knew how the ecosystem worked. <laughs> 
The answer would not come from the study of nature, but from a new kind of machine, the computer. Jay Forrester studied electrical engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he became one of the early innovators in computers. And in the 1950s, he built America's early warning system. It was a global network of radar installations, all linked to giant computers in the United States. Its aim was to create a stable balance in the nuclear standoff of the Cold War. Forrester was convinced that the whole world, not just nature, was composed of systems. And he believed that by building his own man-made system, the Early Warning Network, he had identified how all systems stabilised themselves. It was through a mechanism called feedback. What Forrester meant by this was that every action we take has consequences that feed through the system and then return to shape our future behaviour in ways we cannot see. But the computers could. They had the power to analyse the true consequences of human actions. What Forrester called feedback loops. Forrester was one of the leaders of an ambitious new scientific movement called cybernetics. Cybernetics said that everything from human brains to cities and even entire societies could be seen as systems, regulated and governed by feedback. It fascinated both biologists and physicists because it seemed to offer a new insight into how order is maintained in the world. It also had powerful implications for human beings because cybernetics saw human beings not as individuals in charge of their own destiny but as components in systems. At its heart, cybernetics was a computer's eye view of the world. And from that perspective, there was no difference between human beings and machines. They were just nodes in networks, acting and reacting to flows of information. And cybernetics transformed the idea of the ecosystem, because it seemed to explain how ecosystems stabilised themselves. They did it through feedback. It would lead ecology to rise up and become one of the dominant sciences of the 20th century. The key figures were two American ecologists. They were brothers called Howard and Eugene Odom. Howard Odom took cybernetics and used it as a tool to analyse the underlying structure of nature. In the 1950s, he travelled the world, collecting data from ponds in North Carolina to a tropical rainforest in Guatemala and a coral reef in the Pacific. In each case, he reduced the bewildering complexity of nature to cybernetic networks. The ecosystems were drawn out as electrical circuits with feedback loops that showed how energy flowed around the system between all the animals and the plants. Odom even built real electrical circuits to represent the environments and he used them to adjust the feedback levels in the system. Howard Odom's brother Eugene then took these ideas and he used them to define a powerful vision of nature that still dominates our imaginations today. He wrote a book called The Fundamentals of Ecology that became the bible of the science. It portrayed the whole planet as a network of interlinked ecosystems and Tansley's machine hypothesis became a scientific certainty. But to make their theory work, the Odin brothers had taken a metaphor that the ecosystem worked like a machine. But then, instead of looking at the data that they had gathered from the natural world and trying to find out if this was true, the Odin brothers did the opposite. They simplified the data to an extraordinary degree. They took the complexity and the variability of the natural world and they pared it down so it would fit with the equations and the circuits they had drawn. And as they did this, it stopped being a metaphor and became what seemed to be a scientific description of reality.
One of Howard Odom's assistants later wrote that what they were really doing was creating a machine-like fantasy of stability. Driven by the desire for prestige, he said, biological reality disappeared. Organisms were expected to act mechanically in predictable ways. Animals became robots. And the ideas were never presented as hypotheses to be tested. But this fusion of cybernetics and ecology was going to lead to far more than just a new idea of nature. For out of it was about to come a new organising principle for human society as well. It would be a vision of a new kind of world. One without the authoritarian exercise of power and the old political hierarchies. A vision that was different from past ideologies because it mirrored how order was created in nature. The man behind it was a utopian visionary who had worked as an engineer in the US military. He was called Buckminster Fuller. I will make my life an experiment, he said, to search for the principles that govern the universe. Fuller had invented a radically new kind of structure that was based on the underlying system of order in nature. It was called a geodesic dome. It was very simple but incredibly strong. Giant geodesic domes were built to house the radar installations for America's early warning system in the Arctic. Fuller's geodesic domes imitated the idea of the ecosystem. Each tiny strut was weak, but when thousands were joined to form a giant interconnecting web, they became strong and stable. Fuller believed that this principle of copying nature could be applied not just to structures, but to creating new systems to manage societies. But in order to do this, Fuller realised that there was going to have to be a conceptual shift in the way human beings saw their position in the world. Instead of seeing themselves as members of nations or classes or hierarchies of power, people should instead see themselves as equal members of a global system. To persuade them, Fuller used the image of the spacecraft that NASA had built to take Americans to the moon. NASA had employed ecologists to help design a closed system for the astronauts inside the cabin. It was constantly monitored by computers to keep it in perfect balance. And in 1964, Fuller wrote a manifesto called the Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. It said that the world should be seen as one giant spaceship and that all human beings should try and manage that global system so it was kept in a perfect balance, just like the tiny cabin of the spacecraft. There was a threat, though, to this new vision, Fuller said. It was politicians, because politicians believed that they could control the system. And that always led to struggles for power, and out of that came wars. Instead, the system should be allowed to find its own natural order, and there would be no need for hierarchies and power any longer. If man is going to stay on board our spaceship Earth, it can't be done by politics because politics is so inadequate. And this cannot be commanded by politics because a politician doesn't know about such a thing. He has to go on what have you, which is the, the kind of design he now has. So all he can do is give you war. And Fuller's ideas caught the imagination of a generation who had become disillusioned with politics. The counterculture had emerged after the student movement had failed to change the structure of power in America. Between 1967 and 1971, over half a million Americans left the cities and set out to create thousands of experimental communities it was one of the biggest migrations in American history. They used Buckminster Fuller's geodesic domes to build their new homes. But more than that, they adopted his cybernetic ideas as their organizing principle. The communes deliberately had no hierarchy of control or authority. Instead, the central idea was that everyone should see themselves as part of a system, a distributed network that could stabilize itself just like the ecosystems in nature. 
In the communes, anything that smacked of politics was forbidden. No coalitions or alliances with others in the group were permitted. Instead, individuals dealt with each other one-to-one -one in group sessions, in which they told each other how they were feeling about each other. Mm -hmm. well, Richard, I don't know if I want you to beat you. Because I'm afraid. I'd like you to try to reach me. I don't know whether I'd like you to reach me. They remained free individuals. Yet at the same time, through this system of feedback, the group would be stable. There was another group of visionaries in California who believed that the communes were only a prototype for a self-organizing society built on a global scale. They were the engineers who were inventing the new computer technologies on the West Coast. And the way that they were going to develop these technologies would be shaped by this vision of a natural order that combined humans and machines. At the end of 1968, a group of computer pioneers took a conscious decision. They would give up developing large mainframes. Instead, they would create a way of linking small, personal computers in networks. These pioneers believed that in the future, computer networks would allow you to create the very kind of society that was being developed in the communes, but on a global scale. Everyone could be free as individuals, not dominated any longer by old hierarchies or controlled politically. Instead, they would be linked together in a global system that would find its own natural order. It would do it through the feedback of information between millions of people on their personal computers. By the late 1960s, what had happened was that our modern idea of nature, the ecosystem, and cybernetic theories about computers had fused together. Out of it had come an epic new vision of how to manage the world without the old corruption of power. It was a vision that seemed to be different from all past political attempts to change the world because it was based on the natural order. By the early 1970s, it was clear that there was a global environmental crisis. But it was also clear that politicians had no idea how to deal with it. The crisis baffled them because of its horrifying complexity. It crossed across national boundaries and it involved the whole of nature. But then, a man emerged who said he knew how to save the world from this disaster. He was the cybernetic scientist who had built America's early warning system, Jay Forrester. By now, Forrester had become a powerful figure because he used his computers to build models of corporations and even whole cities as systems. Then, Forrester became involved with a think tank called the Club of Rome. They were a group of international businessmen and technocrats who were trying to find a way of solving the environmental crisis. At a meeting in Switzerland, Forrester told them that the only way to do this was to look at the world as an entire cybernetic system. Forrester set up a team of systems theorists. They built a computer model of the world. The team designed it as a giant cybernetic system in which all known data about population growth, industrial production, food and agriculture, natural resources and pollution were all fed in. The team then ran the model, and what it predicted was an imminent global collapse. The Club of Rome then held a press conference where they announced that the computer had predicted that the world was heading for a disaster. From a very large number of computer runs, making various assumptions, ad adopting various maxima and minima, there is in fact a general forecast of a breakdown of world society in the first decades of the next century. We regard the, the MIT report as an extraordinarily important initial pioneering effort. It's opening up a great new field of research, research on the world as a system. The Club of Rome published a book called The Limits to Growth, which laid out Forrester's world model and its frightening conclusions. It was a bestseller, and it transformed the debate about the environment. Because Forrester's model offered a way of conceptualizing the problem that seemed to be scientific and therefore neutral. His vision of the world as one interconnected system 
seemed to transcend politics and the petty interests of nations. Then, in Stockholm in 1972, the United Nations held a conference for the first time ever on the world environmental crisis. The world needed to be managed in a new, non-political way to avoid the threat of global collapse. Now, this is the beginning of a debate. Nobody's decided precisely what the limits are. One can question whether it's 2010 where we all collapse or 2050 when we all collapse. But what is absolutely certain is you cannot run a planetary society on the total irresponsible sovereignty of 120 different governments. It simply can't be done. Forrester's apocalyptic predictions dominated the conference. But he also said that his computer model showed the only way of avoiding that disaster. World governments, he said, should give up on any idea of promoting continual growth. Instead, they should create a new kind of steady state for the world. Their job was now to hold the world system in a balanced equilibrium to avoid the collapse. Forrester was arguing for a fundamental shift in the role of politics and politicians. They should give up trying to change the world. And instead, the aim of politics should now be to manage the existing system, to hold it in equilibrium. But large sections of the environmental movement were opposed to this idea, and they held protests outside the conference. They said that the idea of enforcing stability on the world was not neutral. That the limits to growth model was not being used to save the world, but to control it. Critics of Forrester's model pointed out that he had put in no feedback loops for politics and political change. The idea that in the future, human beings might adapt to the problems by changing their values and goals, and thus changing the whole system, was absent. Human beings were only present in the model as mechanistic nodes. It was a machine vision of the world, which could not imagine a future where human beings, unlike machines, would behave in ways that they hadn't before. That led to only two choices. You either preserve the existing system in a steady state, or face catastrophe. And this, the protesters argued, suited those who wanted to maintain the status quo those in power. The real role of the environmental movement, they said, was not to hold the world stable, but to struggle to change it. Because it was the greed of the Western elites that was causing the environmental crisis. The movement, they claimed, was being hijacked by right-wing think tanks and Cold War technocrats who were using the balance of nature as a political trick. But the protests were in vain. Because Forrester's cybernetic vision of the world as one interconnected system now began to penetrate deep into the public imagination. It's quite clear that the entire Earth has to be treated as a spaceship, run as a spaceship, planned as a spaceship. We're all part of the web of life, and the sooner man fully appreciates this, the better. This image, our home, our Earth, one people in one world, what we've really got to do is manage the entire planet as a single system. Well, ecology is a balance of nature. It's the relationship between me and uh, plants and animals and the world in general. Now the problem is totally global, which is going to mean running the entire planet as a single system. Without upsetting the natural balances that are already there. Ecology, yes. That's what I'm talking about. What began to rise up in the 1970s was the idea that we and everything else on the planet are connected together in complex webs and networks. Out of that were going to come epic visions of connectivity, like the Gaia theory, and utopian ideas about the World Wide Web and the global economic system. Underlying this was a profound shift. What was beginning to disappear was the Enlightenment idea that human beings are separate from the rest of nature and masters of their own destiny. Instead, we began to see ourselves as components, cogs in a system, and our duty was to help that system maintain its natural balance. <laughs> 
What made this idea so powerful was that it didn't seem to be based on a political ideology. It was a scientific idea of organization that mirrored the natural world. But at precisely this moment, in the mid-1970s, the science that supported the idea fell apart. A new generation of ecologists began to produce empirical evidence that showed that ecosystems did not tend towards stability. That the very opposite was true. That nature, far from seeking equilibrium, was always in a state of dynamic and unpredictable change. Ecologists began to revisit environments that were supposed to be models of stability, started to look at the history of ecosystems, and what they discovered began to undermine the very foundations of the science. The theory said that when ecosystems were disturbed by storms or fires or floods, they would always try and return to their original balanced state. But study after study showed that the very opposite was true that after the disturbances, the plants and animals would recombine in radically different ways. The history of nature was full of radical dislocations and unpredictable change. There was no stable pattern. But even as this was happening, a huge experiment began that aimed to prove convincingly how stability was maintained in ecosystems. An ecologist called George Van Dyne set out to create a computer model of the grasslands that stretched across Colorado. All the animals, insects, plants and the systems that linked them were going to be recreated inside a computer. Van Dyne hired dozens of researchers to begin collecting data on everything that lived in the grasslands and what was underneath in the soil. They built a machine that travelled across hundreds of square miles, hoovering up insects and small mammals. These were then opened up to find out what they had eaten. Other researchers followed larger animals to find out in minute detail what they were eating. George Van Dyne then used all the data to construct a vast, intricate model that simulated how all the different elements of the system, the plants and animals, interacted. Every species had its own sub-model that was then linked through feedback loops to other species and their submodels. But when George Van Dyne ran the model, what happened seemed to make no sense. No stable underlying pattern emerged. Van Dyne was convinced that all the model needed was more data. And he worked feverishly, sometimes all night, putting more and more information into the computer model. But in fact, he was just making the problem worse. The ecosystem theory had worked for previous ecologists because they had ruthlessly simplified nature. What Van Dyne was really doing with his mountains of data was recreating the real chaotic instability of nature inside his computer. In 1981, Van Dyne died of a heart attack at the age of 48 and the project was closed down. The collapse of his experiment marked the end of the theory that somewhere in nature is an ultimate order, a balanced equilibrium. The scientific basis had fallen away, but the idealistic vision of the self-organizing system continued to grow. The reason was that in an age of mass democracy, where the individual was sacrosanct, and politics discredited and distrusted, it offered the promise of a new egalitarian world order. In the early part of this century, the idea of the self-organizing network re-emerged in what seemed to be its original radical form. Beginning in 2003, a wave of spontaneous revolution swept through Asia and Europe. In each case, hundreds of thousands of people flooded into the capitals of Georgia, the Ukraine and Kyrgyzstan and they forced the old corrupt leaders from power. In all these cases, no one seemed to be in charge. But then, journalists discovered that the internet had played a key role. It had brought millions of people together to create revolutions that had no guiding ideology except a desire for self-determination and for freedom. 
It seemed to be the triumph of the vision that had begun with the computer utopians in California in the 1960s. They had dreamt of a time when interconnected webs of computers would allow individuals to create new, non-hierarchical societies, just like in the commune experiments, but on a global scale. Now that dream seemed to be really coming true. In 2009, Twitter and Facebook appeared to play a key role in organizing the protests in Iran. But in all the revolutions, that new sense of freedom lasted only for a moment. What had been forgotten in the optimism about the revolutions was what had really happened in the original experiments in the communes. Ah. They all failed. Most lasted no more than three years, oh, some for less than six months. And what tore them all apart was the very thing that was supposed to have been banished, power. The commune members discovered that some people were more free than others. Strong personalities came to dominate the weaker members of the group, but the rules of the self-organizing system refused to allow any organized opposition to this oppression. The failure of the commune movement and the fate of the revolutions show the limitations of the self-organizing model. It cannot deal with the central dynamic forces of human society, politics and power. The hippies took up the idea of the network society because they were disillusioned with politics. They believed that this alternative way of ordering the world was good because it was based on the underlying order of nature. But this was a fantasy. In reality, what they adopted was an idea taken from the cold and logical world of the machines. Now, in our age, we are all disillusioned with politics. And this machine organizing principle has risen up to become the ideology of our age. But what we are discovering is that if we see ourselves as components in a system, that it is very difficult to change the world. It is a very good way of organizing things, even rebellions, but it offers no ideas about what comes next. And just like in the communes, it leaves us helpless in the face of those already in power in the world.